Welcome to Nuked Radio. This is episode 100. Today is Thursday, March 14th, 2013. I'm your host, Christina Consolo, and with me today is the ever-present Jules, and we have a very special guest, the United Knowledge from YouTube. And we're going to be hearing from him about admitted scientific occurrences of boom events historically and what he has uncovered through his research. Before we talk to him, though, I have a few news stories I need to share. The seals are back in the news. Sickened Alaska animals are getting more tests for Fukushima radionuclides, oozing sores, bleeding, swollen internal organs, and hair loss. This appeared in the Alaska Dispatch yesterday. It began in July 2011. Indigenous hunters in Alaska's Arctic noticed ice seals they rely on for food and other uses covered in oozing sores and losing hair. They were sick and some were dying. As of this month, despite the international group of scientists and researchers the declaration pulled together, no cause has been officially identified for the illness plaguing the ice seals. Walruses and polar bears have turned up with similar ailments. Some of the animals were also found to have bleeding and swelling in their lungs, livers, lymph nodes, and other internal organs. Preliminary tests to determine whether exposure from the 2011 Fukushima nuclear plant accident in Japan have also not revealed any answers. More tests on tissue samples for radionuclides associated with the event are being conducted, but those done so far have not yielded any direct connection. And anyone who listens to this show on a regular basis knows that we have made numerous attempts to contact scientists at NOAA about the SEAL tests that were due to be in in February of 2012. Also on any news, the dreaded Daini Daiichi combo, high radiation detector alarms went off at the Daini plant, which is just south of Fukushima 1. There's no explanation though what happened at Onagawa, since we have pictures showing black and white smoke pouring out of that nuke plant, which is north of Fukushima. Two years ago today, New York Times reported the U.S. would be harmed only by a full meltdown at Fukushima. Months later, it was revealed that full meltdowns occurred. That article appeared in the New York Times by William J. Broad, March 13th of 2011, Blogs were churning with alarm, but officials insisted that unless the quake-damaged nuclear plants deteriorated into full meltdown, any radiation that reached the United States would be too weak to do any harm. Of course, we know now that there were three meltdowns that are ongoing and a fire in a spent fuel pool, which is even worse than a meltdown. Study, up to 47 quadrillion becquerels of cesium-137 were released into the Pacific from Fukushima, which is nearly 50 times the original TEPCO estimate. This appeared in the Biogeosciences Discussions, and this is only one radionuclide. There were anywhere from 1,300 to 2,000 that blew out of the reactors. One more study, and this broke at the end of the Caldecott Conference in New York City, Fukushima fallout has now been detected in fish from the Atlantic Ocean. I also wanted to mention how important it is that we work together. I had a gentleman from Minnesota that sent me a video of him checking one of the uh, air filters in his house. The video was posted February 24. Somehow it got lost in my message feed, and he messaged me back yesterday and said, what did you ever think of that video I sent you? And I watched it, and... He was getting, uh, with his inspector, over 500 CPMs on this air filter in his house. So I posted that today asking for feedback from the group Radiation Watch, and Chris Busby actually chimed in and said he would like the filter so he can analyze it more carefully. So this is uh, good for us because if you've listened to the show, you know Noki and I have been trying to figure out what is going on in Minnesota, there's been a number of um, alert level radiation readings that have come from that area. There is some uh, fracking wells that are um, upwind of there. And he messaged me back and said he did test the filter again. Two weeks later, it was still reading over 200 CPM. So we definitely need a breakdown of what's in that filter. My guest today is the United Knowledge from YouTube, whose work I first came across from his significantly researched and detailed posts on GLP. 
And from there, I found his YouTube channel, which many of us have been following closely when it appeared that not only does he do just meticulous research, but he's found some uncanny connections, and he's been able to predict some geological events from that. Now, he's covered vast plate movements in the Pacific, patterns found in buoy data preceding quakes in Indonesia and Alaska, megaquakes and magnetic field anomalies, booms in Ohio, New York, Texas, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Alaska, and other states that are associated with shaking events and earthquakes, and how the media has responded to these stories. And today he's going to explain how he uncovered this info, where he finds his data, and where he thinks this is all leading to. We are very happy to have him today on the show as a guest. So Lance, welcome to Nuked Radio. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me on. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in this? Well, my name is Lance. I'm currently 23. And a few years ago, I was just living a normal life, you know, normal young life, going out nightlife, living in South Florida. And I started having a few intense spiritual experiences, and it kind of shook me up. And then the Japan earthquake happened, and I was like, okay, I need to start paying attention to things. I just had the, if you could say, inner message that I needed to pay attention. And I just started researching, and it became overwhelming. And I just divulged into everything all at once, and it became a little overwhelming. And I was just really became a person that was just seeking answers. I just wanted to understand what's really going on and the truth about really everything. Because there's been so many changes, so many unexplained things, and then all these booms started happening around the world and birds falling dead from the sky year after year after year around Arkansas. I mean, just so many things. And it's like, what's really going on? So I became motivated to just do my own research after a while because I wasn't getting any answers from officials or really anywhere online or any books. So I was just really studying the data. Uh, I'm a person that believes that we don't need an official to tell us what's really going on. I believe that the earth is telling us what's going on. And all we have to do is just pay attention and study the data, compare it to historical data, and we'll really get the answers from that. So what I started doing is just really documenting everything, plotting locations, plotting dates, plotting space weather events, earthquakes, just putting it all together, just basically putting pieces of the puzzle together and seeing how it actually does fit. And then the boom started increasing, making the news that people's houses are shaking, that there's cracks in the ground, people's floors are lifting up, making the news. They're saying, we don't know what it is. It's unexplained. We have no answers. And I really, really, really started paying attention to this in early December. And I decided, you know what? No one's really giving fair coverage to these boom reports. They're so widespread. They're making the news. <laughs> the news stations don't have any answers. So I decided, let's see if I can figure this out, if I can find some answers and really research. So I spent about two months, this last December and January, every single day researching and finding every single media report of booms and shaking that have made the news and have been verified, and I started documenting them on a map. And I started documenting the date, the time, and earthquake information. And, well, one thing led to another, and it became quite scary with the results after two months. And I put out a video on January 31st covering every single aspect of all the media reports of booms and shaking from December and January and what's really going on, including the cover-up. That's pretty much where I am now with the booms. So you, you pretty much start when you have a, a question about something, whatever scientific admitted occurrence you can find. And I think we had a, um, an article that we had talked about from the USGS about earthquake booms, Seneca guns, and other sounds. I was just getting honestly pissed off from the official stories we were being told. You know, I mean, these booms that are saying, oh, there was shooting a box of Tannerite, and it shook houses within a 40-mile radius. I'm like, that, there's no logic to that. <laughs> and lightning isn't even hurt itself that far. So I started research. I wanted to see, okay, is this only recent or is it back historical? Is there any scientific evidence? Does this go back? How far does this go back of documented evidence of these booms? 
And I found absolutely incredible evidence and articles, both from USGS and Science Magazine, that actually got in cover and state themselves the reality of geological booms. And they have happened throughout history, going as far back as the early 1800s. There are reports of artillery-like sounds and booms that have occurred before and during the new major earthquakes of 18 and 1812. And you can find that information directly from USGS if you put in under your search engine USGS booms. You can write about it there and give links to it as well. So I was like, wow, hmm, going back to the 1800s before any of that fracking or harp or anything like that, back in the olden days, these booms were documented before a major geological upheaval. So most recently, I found this only a few weeks ago, and it blew my mind. It really hit home hard, and it was exactly what I've been looking for. In 1979, Science Magazine put out this article titled Bronchides, Natural Explosive Noises, directly from Science Magazine. And they go on to say, historical and scientific records from various parts of the world contain many accounts of episodes of mysterious booming or explosive noises. The historical records suggest occurrences of booming noises in various degrees of association with earthquakes. And they give some examples, basically historic examples, of precursory booming events leading up to major earthquakes directly from Science Magazine. Now, I told you about the one from the New Madrid, and from Science Magazine, they brought up a couple others. For example, the 1886 Charleston earthquake, that was a 7.3 in South Carolina. Well, believe it or not, booms were documented 18 months prior to that earthquake, and they were ongoing. And I'm even seeing right here um, reports of these explosive sounds were even published three months before the great earthquake in South Carolina. And we could even go further. I even found in San Francisco, another example is given, as they say, the 1906 7.8 earthquake in San Francisco. The winter prior to that earthquake, it was documented that there was booming sounds, rumbling, and detonations that were occurring the winter leading up to the great San Francisco earthquake. And all this can be found at the Science Magazine article put out in 1979. I'll be sure to give you a link. So... And it's just an incredible, an incredible article, and it ends off perfectly in my mind. The last sentence of this article says, But in light of the information that such noises of natural origin exist, and that they have a possible relationship to earthquakes, the occurrence anywhere of unexplained episodes of booming noises should be investigated and not be ascribed automatically to an artificial origin. And if we've been paying attention to the news lately and all these news reports on TV, what are they doing? They're ascribing it automatically to artificial origin. And they're like trying. They're trying to say it's everything but natural and geological, even though a historical record says differently. You know, and it's just it's been incredible to observe this. They either jump the gun and say someone shot Tannerite or there was a plane flying overhead or with, you know, supersonic sounds. Or I found one most recently that was quite intriguing in eastern Texas where they said that they were doing seismic testing, that there's houses shaking and booms, no one knows what's going on. And then the official story later on was, oh, a company was doing seismic testing. And I eventually said, seismic testing? What's that? Well, basically a company digs a hole in the ground and throws in explosives and measures how the ground reacts. So I found... In an actual um, residential community where these booming and shaking were happening, I said, seismic testing? So I researched, what do they do for seismic testing? Well, there's actually risks involved, and the company has to notify the, the residents and get written permission for them to do seismic testing. So, I mean, they've been doing everything that is just not matching up logically. And they're not just telling you, they're just not telling the truth here. The closest we came to truth with these booms is probably last year in Wisconsin. I'm sure many of you have heard about the Clintonville booms that went on for like a month and a half. And USGS at first said, oh, they're not earthquakes. We don't know what's happening. And no one knows what's going on. And people, there's cracks in the walls and the ground. People were getting startled. I was even seeing on the news people were moving. They were getting so frightened they were selling their homes and moving. And then eventually USGS, asked, excuse me, USGS came out later and said, oh, well, we made a mistake. There were earthquakes. The largest was a 1.5 and little microquakes. And all that 
is your explanation for all the booms and shaking that we can go. A minor, minuscule earthquake swarm. It was March 24th, just before 4 in the morning, when Brian Sullivan finally heard what he had been waiting days for. I pointed the, uh, the microphone in the area of Olin Park. It's the lowest area in the, um, in the city. And just a few seconds after pressing record, he captured this. Clintonville city officials confirm it's the same noise that has been waking up residents there for weeks. It took a few days, but... Uh, it was successful. The Sun Prairie resident and audio student at Madison College says curiosity caught the best of him, and he was determined to go and capture the sound. The U.S. Geological Survey has taken a quick listen to the clip and provided this graph of the audio. Experts say first inspection of this graph shows it's consistent with what they would expect for an earthquake. The one thing that sticks out in my mind the most is the way the ground shook after the boom. I heard the boom, like I consciously registered it as, as the boom, and then felt the ground shake. So it's just following all this evidence and seeing how they're not being truthful, how no news station brings up this reality that's been acknowledged by USGS and been acknowledged by even Science Magazine. Uh, on some of these news stations, they say, we checked with USGS. There's been no earthquakes. But do these news stations actually think USGS talks about booms themselves, and here they are experiencing them. I mean, you know, it's pretty incredible. The other thing that's so incredible, too, is when you put out a video about this, and I've, I've dropped a few links into chat, and I'll continue to do so, because I, I really want you guys to go through and watch um, Lance's video where he posts the news stories, uh, the response of citizens, um, the fact that there's really no follow-up done on any of these news stories, and then uh, what he's uncovered with lots of maps, diagrams, screenshots, so you really get a picture of what's going on. And you found this, like, diagonal line that kind of goes through the New Madrid. It, it's pointing to the area of uh, New York, Maine, and it goes all the way through to Arizona. And you predicted future events along this line and within days of me reading that post that you had on GLP we had more earthquakes and booms right along that line. Yes. So the way that I started doing this really in the beginning was I started plotting the location on a map of where the booms were and the date that they happened. And I also started plotting all earthquakes and then I compared that to a historical USGS earthquake hazard zone. And I was finding that 100% of all the boom reports have hit an earthquake hazard zone presented by USGS. For example, you're not going to find boom reports, say, in Minnesota or South Dakota. You know, they've been hitting around earthquake hazard zones. And within a couple of days, you would find an earthquake maybe 20 miles away from the boom report. And I just started plotting everything. And then when I was starting to plot everything, I was actually seeing incredible things starting to line up. And... Then I started noticing the cover-up reports and noticing that multiple boom reports over great distances occurring at the same exact time. And that really opened the door to a lot as well. So before I get into the diagonal pool, I'd just like to share with people just how they are definitely covering this up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually drop a few links in the chat room right now. I'm going to send you to Jamestown, New York, um, this news station that covered booms from January 13th on Sunday. You have a lot of fans in chat today. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get to the bottom of a mysterious boom. It was reported par across parts of the southern tier. We've gotten emails, Facebook comments, calls to our newsroom all about this. The 
And that happened throughout the evening, and we've been checking with the National Earthquake Center website. So far, there have not been any reports of an earthquake in our area. Those calls started coming into our newsroom around 4 o'clock Sunday afternoon. Folks as far away as Alfred Allman in Allegheny County wanted to talk about what they experienced. One volunteer fire chief we spoke with overnight said the boom was so loud he thought a house might have exploded. Just all of a sudden there was just this humongous boom, just one boom. I mean, I honestly thought like a house blew up started looking for, you know, a plume of smoke or something. And just to recap, there have been no reports of any earthquakes or explosions in this area. We're going to be all over this story throughout the day, touching base with local experts in hopes of shedding some light on exactly what happened. So then about five days later, I found this article from Gorham, New York. It was put out by, it looks like a newspaper state, uh, article here, Mysterious Booms Puzzle Gorham Residents. So... Here it says it was published January 17th, and they said that this occurred last Sunday. So if you go to January 17th, last Sunday was January 13th, the same day as the Jamestown booms. So it actually said here that the house was shaking, vibrating, people were calling the police here in Gorham, New York, and I found the time in the article, and it said it started at about 6 p.m., and then a few minutes later there was another boom. So what does this mean? This means basically in Gorham, New York, and Jamestown, New York, pretty much within minutes, the same exact time, there is booms and people's houses shaking. And if you look at the distance between Gorham, New York, and Jamestown, New York, it's about 100 miles away. So you have two different locations, two different articles at the same time reporting on people's houses shaking and booms and people calling the police. So I'm like, wow, that's a great distance, 100 miles at the same time this is happening. So eventually, the Jamestown, New York news station eventually came out the next day, actually, and said that someone shot 18 pounds of tannar in Busti, New York. And that accounts for all the booms in the area, all people's houses shaking. And if you go into the comments section there, you'll see everyone saying, shooting tannar doesn't cause houses shaking and booms over a 40-mile radius, because the, the sheriff in the county said that the booms and shaking and sounds were heard as far away as Bradford, Pennsylvania, which is about 40 miles away from Jamestown. That whole area was booming and shaking, and he said someone that shot 18 pounds of tannerite caused that. I'm like, wow, these people in the comments section know that's BS, and they don't even know over 100 miles away, at the same time people's houses were shaking and there were booms. So that's one example of how these things are happening over great distances at the same exact time and how they're really covering it up or just looking for any excuse just so people forget about it and dismiss it. That's one example, and I can go back and actually follow that diagonal line like I was telling you about. If you draw a straight line basically from the St. Lawrence Seaway, you will end up around eastern Texas and Dallas, Texas. And we can actually go back to December 5th. And I covered this as well in the Booms New Madrid video I put out. In Texoma, which is basically Texas and Oklahoma news station, they put it put out on December 5th, 2012, loud booms heard across Texoma as a confirmed cause. So basically they give about six or seven counties that booms and shaking were reported on December 5th, early in the morning. Let's see here. It started at 8 this morning, and then again a little after 2 in the afternoon, December 5th. And they said that there's a supersonic plane, that flew this area of where uh, Texas and Oklahoma meet. They give some counties like Love County, Carter County, uh, Oklahoma. And they said a supersonic plane was making those booms by flying overhead. And that's the cause of the booms, right? Well, not quite. You see... I then found this. This is, let's see if I can find this here. This is another, this is um, Corsona Daily Sun. This is a newspaper, Mysterious Tremors Puzzle Experts from, guess the date, December 5th. So they wanted to say, earthquake-like tremors and booms started Tuesday afternoon, continuing until early Wednesday, early Wednesday morning, just like on early Wednesday morning, December 5th, by Oklahoma. So basically, in this article, they were not saying, they don't know what's going on. They were saying over a great 40 to 50 mile range, there is booms and houses shaking. <clears throat> I'm reading here. Basically, heavy tremors. People were calling the police. And it was actually ongoing for about a 12-hour period. 
the range and descriptions of houses, quote, popping and shaking doesn't seem to fit anything, including the disturbances reported around fracking drill sites. This, quote, this is an unexplained event, likely of a natural origin. Um, but they really don't know. And, of course, USGS says, we don't see anything. We don't know what's going on. But the point of this is, this was actually around just south of Dallas, maybe about 50 miles south of Dallas is where this article came out from. And they're saying over a great distance in mid-southern Texas, booms and houses shaking. At the same time, there are booms and houses shaking in southern Oklahoma. But in Oklahoma, they said it was a supersonic plane. So is the same plane flying in southern mid-Texas at the same exact time there as well? I don't think so. And at least the secondary article says mysterious tremors puzzle experts. They don't even go into trying to cover it up. They're actually a little bit more truthful in the secondary article. But the point is, you can coincide these articles side by side, and you'll see that these booms are happening at the same time, within minutes, maybe an hour. And usually one station is truthful, another one's trying to cover it up. But either way, it's happening at the same time. We're not being told the real story. Some other links that you posted under your video, Tennessee, one from Citizen Tribune in Morristown, one from the Greenville Sun in Greene County, one from WKYT in Kentucky, one from WPRI in Rhode Island, one from the Salem Patch in Massachusetts, the one that you already mentioned in Jamestown that was on WIVB, one from MPN Now in Gorham, one from WKBN in Ohio, uh, Indiana, there's a couple from the Tri-State homepage, Kentucky, Morton's Gap, and Madisonville. And you have these all listed under the video, uh, Texas, Oklahoma, from KTEN, and from what you just discussed in Texoma. And it's, a, it's pretty overwhelming when you look at all this together. Oh, yeah, it and is. <laughs> some, there was a, a very interesting correlation to the magnetosphere that you also came across. Can you explain a little bit about that? So this goes back about pretty much early last year, early 2012. And this is really before I started getting into the booms. So basically what I wanted to figure out was if there was an outside source or force in connection to the large earthquakes that have happened the past three years, say, for example, the 8.8 in Chile, February 27, 2010, the 9.0 in Japan, March 11, 2011, and on April 11, the twin Sumatra 8-plus earthquakes that hit April 11, 2012. So what I was doing was I was just looking around those time frames to see if there was anything interesting going on. So basically what I found was there were reoccurring magnetic field disturbances happening during the same time period yearly around the period of those earthquakes. Let me give you an example. If you go to February 25th, 2010, you will see a great magnetic field disturbance. Basically, the magnetic field is going haywire. And then if you go to February 25th, the next years after that, 2011, 2012, and now even 2013 on the same day, you will see magnetic field disturbances. If you go to 2012 and 2011, you will see on March 11th, the day of the Japan earthquake. If you look at the magnetic field midday, right around the time of the earthquake, it actually the magnetic field is heading in the opposite direction, basically something pushing it the opposite direction, going sideways. And if you go to March 11, 2012, doing the same thing, and then a few days later, there was a supposed magnetosphere, magnetopause, complete reversal, where everything slipped to the other side. Suspicious observers covered this on YouTube, and a lot of people have. Um, NASA actually wiped out the data, so you can never go back and look at it anymore, but it did happen. It was well documented. And if you check magnetic field data from 2011 2012, you see the same kind of activity happening, basically. And then in, uh, for April, which basically is about from March 30th to about April 15th, the last two years you'll see multiple disturbances of the magnetic field going completely haywire. And I saw this, and last year I was like, wow, in April, you can even refer back to my Facebook. I was like, I have never seen anything like this before. This is the most severe I've ever seen the magnetic field get disturbed and for the most prolonged period of time. And about three days later was the Sumatra earthquakes. So I don't really know what the source is of that, but I did find a correlation of the magnetic field having reoccurring disturbances around the same time period yearly. So that's another reason why 
I was zoomed in and focused in on the boom starting December because I had a feeling they would increase while we're nearing the same time period again during this year. Another interesting fact about that, last year I was using NICT magnetosphere simulation, which is a source from Japan. And I was actually covering magnetic field data, putting it on YouTube videos, and I also find sometimes a direct correlation between incoming charged particles. And I started putting out predictions of earthquakes and the charged particle influx. And, well, to put it simply, right after the Sumatra earthquakes, the NICT magnetosphere simulation was shut down and terminated, the source that I was using and documenting everything from. And this site has been up and running for over 10 years. And the official story of why they terminated the site was the lease on their supercomputer that puts out the data expired. So because the lease expired on their supercomputer, they could no longer provide real-time magnetosphere information. I was like, what? And this happened literally weeks Three weeks after the Sumatra earthquakes, when I saw that magnetic field disturbance, I was like, what's going on? Why are they terminating? That was the source I was using, so I was pretty upset. But then I noticed something else, and that really settled it for me, was not only did they terminate the live feed, which was up and running for over 10 years, they had a section of archives where you can go back and study magnetosphere and magnetic field data going back over 10 years. Every single day, they had it saved in movie format in their archives, and anybody can go and download it. So not only did they terminate the live feed, they wiped out all the saved data going back 10 years of the magnetosphere and the magnetic field. And I was like, well, if your supercomputer lease expires, that just means you can no longer provide a live feed, but why would you have to clear out your archives so nobody can see it? And then I was actually using the NASA source. I still currently use NASA source, but they only have data saved back going to the end of 2009. So I found that pretty interesting that they decided to ter terminate the site and wipe out that history. Lance, we have somebody on the line who has a comment or question for you. Hello, you're on yeah. Nuked Radio. Hi, my name is Maddie Lynn. Hi, Maddie. Um, I had a comment uh, while I was listening. You guys were talking about uh, magnetosphere anomalies uh, relative to earthquakes. Nick Begich, in his book, Angels Don't Play This Harp, correlated ionospheric disturbances also with earthquakes. So I was interested to hear Lance talk about a, magnet, a magnetosphere correlation. My question that I wanted to ask Lance is relative to tunneling underneath the Earth. I remember when Bush and Cheney were in office, uh, reading an article that Dick Cheney's neighbors complained about booming and their house shaking uh, when he was apparently putting a tunnel in from his house in D.C. to the Capitol. And so I was wondering, is it possible that there's anything like that that's going on? Well, I'm sure that's going on in one aspect or another, especially with the elite. I mean, if you've just been looking at the FEMA plans, <laughs> You know, oh, they're know. loading up on those hollow point bullets, and they're loading up on food, and you can actually put out their KBR, um, basically just a company that works with FEMA, so that, that FEMA is planning on dividing um, the country for natural disasters. And another interesting fact to put out there, remember I said last year on March 13th that the magnetopause and the magnetic field completely reversed? Well, did you know three days later Obama signed an executive order for, natural, for disaster preparedness. Basically, it's an authorization where the government can seize all energy sources, water, food, supplies, transportation, everything. Even it's called peacetime martial law. If you, if you go on to your search engine right now and put in peacetime martial law, you'll come up with all that information. So while I was following all the magnetic field data last year, and I saw the reversal happen, and then a few days later, I see this executive order for disaster preparedness. I'm like, wow, that's interesting timing. You know, and that's really another aspect of all of this. If you see how much ammo they're getting and how much food they've gotten, and I remember, I think it was in 2011, FEMA was ordering body bags and medical supplies and millions upon millions of food supplies. I mean, it's just astronomical. <laughs> so, you know, they're, they're getting prepared. Why are they getting prepared, you know? So... I'm sure that there is that kind of stuff going on. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But as far as the booms are concerned, I don't think there's a correlation with that because it's 
really, I'm looking from a historical perspective, and I see this happening in the 1800s preceding large earthquakes. I see Science Magazine puts out an article about that, so that's really what I'm gunning at, really. <laughs> so you're not looking at anything like fracking either? No, no, because um, I see the historical evidence before fracking, before tunnels and all of this. I see historical evidence preceding large earthquakes. I see Science Magazine putting out and saying that it's natural explosive noises. They give scientific evidence. They even give types of things that can be causing the booms that are all geological. So in my mind, I think, okay, there's a historical perspective before we had any of the technology to be, excuse me, technology to be fiddling around with the earth. This has happened. So that's really where I'm at with that. I'm just thinking but if it's they all were natural. Using, if they were using Tesla technology to create earthquakes, then these booms might possibly precede that also, based on the historical precedent that you cited. Well, they would need something very, very powerful to be doing that. And um, what is interesting, though, is if we look at a historical perspective, we see all the booms preceded earthquake activity in a certain area. But we're seeing booms all across the eastern half of the United States that are ongoing. So I'm pointing at something much more. And um, okay. we're going to get a little bit into that a little bit later in the show. But it's possible, but what I'm seeing right now is really significant. and. Whatever it is, it's not a good sign. I can leave it at that. <laughs> all right. Well, great show. Thanks for all your hard work. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for calling in, Maddie. <clears throat> That's the, the other thing that I want to make sure that we get to today, Lance, is where do you think this is all going? Okay. Well, a few different things before I get there. We were talking about the diagonal pole with the new majority. I'd just like to get back to that. So basically what I was finding, if we look at this map I put out, it's actually on my video links. For example, uh, remember those New York booms I was talking about by the St. Lawrence Seaway? Those occurred on the 13th. On the 16th, along the St. Lawrence Seaway in New York, there was an earthquake. If we go to the heart of the New Madrid, Evansville, they had ongoing booms for a while in Evansville, Indiana. Within a couple days, there was an earthquake in Marion, Illinois, about 50 miles away. We can go, like you were saying, in eastern Tennessee, Seymour, Tennessee, on December 30th, about 300 birds fell dead from the sky. And then in the months that followed, about 20 miles away in Morristown, Tennessee, and in Green County, Tennessee, there were media reports of booms and shaking, all of this within like a 30-mile range of where the birds are falling there from the sky. And then there was an earthquake in eastern Tennessee, um, I think it was a two-point something. I don't have it listed here. But all within like a short, compact range. So I'm seeing all these booms within a 30-mile radius, birds falling down from the sky in an earthquake. And again, this hits another um, earthquake hazard zone that USGS put out. And of course, the booms in South Carolina, those are still actually ongoing. I found an article covering that actually yesterday. And well, South Carolina was known to have booms preceding the Charleston earthquake of 1886. Now, what is really interesting uh, is following this diagonal pole. And what it looks like to me is the New Madrid is in pending adjustment, where it's pulling diagonally. And there's diagonal pressure building. And I was basically following a, literally a straight line of boom reports going from the St. Lawrence Seaway into the New Madrid. Literally, you can draw a straight line through it. And then I saw an earthquake in New York and an earthquake in Dallas, Texas. I'm like, well, that hits up exactly. And I put out a video on YouTube on January 24th saying, earthquake in Texas confirms New Madrid diagonal pull uptake proven, and there's pressure building. I said, the watch out for booms. Within 24 hours of me putting out that video, there were boom reports, multiple boom reports in eastern Texas, and there was a 4.1 in eastern Texas within 24 hours of me putting out that video. So basically, I was just following the media reports of booms and following the earthquakes, and I was seeing that it was leading to Texas. I put out a video covering Texas, and then within 24 hours, I see a 4.1 there, and everyone's saying that their houses are shaking their booms, which made um, an emergency management center put out on Facebook covering that as well. So there's just so much of this going on. We could go to Guthrie, Oklahoma. They had ongoing booms for a while, and there was recently an earthquake swarm there. So for me trying to figure this out, it's a little complicated, but we can 
determine a few things logically. Number one, the media reports of these booms and shaking are happening in geological hazard zones that the USGS put out. We're not seeing them in Nebraska and South Dakota and Iowa. You know, we're seeing them where it's historically fact that it's a geological zone that is active. So that's one thing we can take into consideration. Number two, we're seeing how booms and great distances can occur at the same exact time. And we can see that earthquake activity picks up around that area during that time as well. That's another fact. Now, trying to figure all this out, we have to look, of course, historically. And when there's a great uptick of booms historically, sometimes two years, like for the Charleston earthquake, it was ongoing for a while, and there was nothing really major going on, just these booms, booms, booms. But these were just documented for small areas. We're seeing this countrywide. We're seeing this majority on the eastern half of the United States. So what does that mean? We're seeing booms around the New Madrid, and we're seeing booms in South Carolina. Both locations have major earthquakes and booms prior to them historically. But we're seeing them all over the place. So what does that mean, you know? That means something much more is pending, much more than just a big earthquake. And that really takes me to what I found most recently, which is what you were talking about with this plate movement sequence. Have you you've seen that video? Would you like to comment on it? The one where you noticed the Alaska buoy? It no, the Indonesia, um, Indo-Australian plate buoy activity triggering a plate movement sequence where the same activity happens over and over again. And what you seem to find, too, is when something happens in one place, there's an adjustment that happens someplace else. Yes, exactly. So I was looking for what is the cause of all this? What is the cause of all these booms, and what's really going on? Could this be a plate adjustment that's pending, and will they try to do a plate adjustment somewhere else that could be triggering this pressure building causing these booms? So this is what I found, and I really really started paying attention to this right after the Twin Sumatra earthquakes. If you don't happen to know, on April 11, 2012, there was two earthquakes, 8.6 and an 8.2 that hit Sumatra, Indonesia. And then in the days that followed, there was a global earthquake swarm. Like there was earthquakes off of Maine, multiple sevens in Central America, just all over the place. And I have never seen anything like that ever, just a global earthquake swarm. So eventually, so officials came out and spoke about it. I found, here's a quote from Fred Polos at the USGS, quote, this was the most powerful event ever recorded in terms of putting stress and other fault zones around the world, end quote. I'm looking here at a French geophysicist. Here's a quote from him. The event suggested the Indo-Australian plate is breaking up along a new plate boundary. Although both are currently on the same plate, Australia is moving faster than India. This is causing a broad area in the center of the Indo-Australian plate to buckle. As a result, the plate may be splitting. Here is Roland Bergman, Earth and Planetary Scientist at UC Berkeley. He says, until now, we seismologists have always said, don't worry about distant earthquakes triggering local quakes. Well, that certainly has now changed. He goes on to say, this study now says that while it is very rare, it may only happen every few decades. It is a real possibility if the right kind of earthquake happens. So that was my starting point. When I saw this event happen in Sumatra, how it triggered a global swarm, how these officials are saying it's the most powerful event ever recorded, putting on stress zones and faults around the world, directly from a USGS official, and just seeing what happened, I was like, okay, was this a one-time event or is this ongoing? Is the Indo-Australian plate having ongoing adjustments? Is it having uh, signs of a pending major adjustment. I mean, I'm looking here at a geophysicist, and he's saying that the center of the Indo-Australian plate is buckling, the plate may be splitting. So I was basically looking for signs if that was accurate. And what I found was very, very disturbing. So there's actually, um, from LiveScience.com, they put out a post covering these quotes. I put it out in a video. It is titled, Indo-Australian Plate Adjustments um, Connected to lower America six times in a row. So basically, during the Sumatra earthquakes of April 11th, 2012, within a few days, there was multiple magnitude 7 earthquakes in Central America and South America. And they, it was admitted that those earthquakes were triggered by the Sumatra earthquakes. So basically, I started following buoy data on the Indo-Australian plate. And I wanted to see if 
is that basically if a plate moves, if a plate adjusts, let's say the seafloor drops, the buoy would then detect that the water column might would rise. Figure, you know, the seafloor drops, water fills the void, and then the water column height, the height of the water detected becomes higher. And that's the way buoys detect plate adjustments. So I was noticing that there have been plate adjustments on the indoor Australian plate. And every time there was a permanent change in the water column height, meaning the plate had an adjustment, within three to nine days later, there was a magnitude 7 plus earthquake that hit lower Central America or upper South America five times in a row within three to nine days. And I actually put this video out a few months ago. I think it was in October. After the third time in a row, I actually put out calling it pole shift sequence because literally that's what it looks like. Every time there's been a documented plate adjustment on the Indo-Australian plate, within three to nine days, there's a magnitude 7 plus earthquake. It's lower Central America, upper South America. It hit exactly five times in a row. And the Indo-Australian plate, triggering earthquakes in that area was actually admitted scientifically during the Sumatra event. So this happened four times in a row. There was a buoy by Java, Indonesia that detected these. I put this out in the video. I give all the screenshots and links. You can look up the buoy data and see for yourself as well. So the first time that this happened, I was just documenting it, which was on <clears throat> August 24th, 2012. And then I saw on August 27th, there was a 7.3 earthquake in El Salvador. I was like, oh, in the Australian adjustment leading to earthquake in lower America. It's just like during the Sumatra events. Okay, that was one time. And I saw it happen again on August 29th. I saw an adjustment by a buoy detecting it on by Java, Indonesia, which is, if you want to look it up, if you want to go to buoy, I know I just do a search, buoy station 53046. There is an adjustment there August 29th. And then September 5th, 7.6 earthquake, Costa Rica. I saw that happen twice in a row. I'm like, hey, something's going on here. Why is it every time I see an adjustment on the indo australian plate, there's a big earthquake in the lower Americas, in a specific area, just like during the Sumatra event. So then on GLP, I actually made a prediction. I saw the, the sequence happening again. And I put out a prediction saying, within a few days, up to two weeks, you're going to see a big earthquake in this area. And it hit exactly. As I said, just by following this plate movement scene, which has started developing over and over and over again. And that happened four times in a row. And right after the fourth time in a row, within days, Noah turned off that buoy that I was using to see these plate movement patterns. They turned it off for the next five months. No data. So basically, at that point forward, I didn't see anything. I couldn't see anything. But most recently, on February 1st, 2013, there was a buoy by the Solomon Islands, and the water column height rose one meter on February 1st, 2013. A few days later, 8.0 earthquake, Solomon Islands. So again, a different buoy this time on the Indo-Australian plate showed a plate adjustment in the 8.0 earthquake in the Solomon Islands right by that buoy, and guess what happened a few days later? Where did the earthquake hit? Columbia, magnitude 7. And that was on February 9th, just a few days later. So basically what's going on is the Indo-Australian plate is pending. There's something pending, some major geological upheaval is pending there because this area is basically moving and it's triggering earthquakes in the lower Americas multiple times in a row. Now six times in a row that is documented. So I believe, in my opinion, seeing this, I'm like, has there ever been a time that a plate has been moving and adjusting, triggering earthquakes in specific areas over and over and over again? I've never seen that recorded anywhere, but it's happening right now. It's ongoing, actually. And even though they turned one buoy off, now a buoy on the Solomon Islands showed a plate adjustment, a big earthquake, and then a big earthquake in the lower Americas again a few days later. So basically, this area is moving and adjusting, adjusting, and something is pending there. Something major is pending on the Indo-Australian plate. And I believe that's the area we need to watch for because it's triggering specific earthquake activity on a global scale over and over and over again on the other side of the globe. So I find that very, very significant. And B, it was admitted from an official at the USGS that that area is putting pressure on fault zones around the world. Quote from USGS official, that area could be moving and putting strain on all the other fault zones causing these booms. And perhaps when this area has another major adjustment, we'll see another major global storm or something worse, just like that happened on April 11, 2012. So that's really where I am with everything. And I wanted to determine 
what's causing these booms? Why is this un ongoing? And once this event happened in Sumatra, once these officials came out and admitted the reality of how it puts stress and fall zones around the world, the play may be splitting, and now I'm sending these ongoing play movement sequences on a global scale, I'm like, hey, well, that could be the cause of everything. I don't see anything else out there that could be really connected. That's the only connection I found. A person in chat was asking if you could talk about a conversation you had with David Morrison. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> That's actually very funny. So back last year, this was approximately early May. Remember I told you about the NICT Magnetosphere simulation being shut down? So yeah. basically, I was predicting when Earth would be getting hit by protons, and there would be auroras and the pressure on Earth's magnetosphere. I made those predictions before any solar eruptions, before NASA put out any forecasts. So on one of my videos last year, David Morris on his official YouTube channel, on my video, made a comment saying that I don't understand science. I have, I have no idea what I'm talking about. So I replied to him. I said, if that's the case, then how come I made these forecasts that came true before you and before NASA? And perhaps you could explain why this is happening. And he didn't reply. And then a few days later, the source I was using, NICT Magnetosphere Simulation, was shut down. The same week David Morrison was on my YouTube channel, it was the same week NICT Magnetosphere <laughs> Simulation, the source I was using, got terminated. That's a fact. So you're so shutting that's down pretty much interesting. data all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. It's, it's incredible. I mean, as soon as I find a direct connection to something, the source gets shut down. I mean, it's pretty funny, actually. It's a little nerve-wracking for me, too, to be honest. We only have uh, about seven or eight minutes left. I have people asking in chat, can we go another hour? And I can't do it today. Jules said she would, but I just can't. And uh, I can't tell you how happy I am that you came on today. And I know a lot of, uh, of your fans that are listening are, are really happy to hear from you, too. You said something at the end of your last video. I'm not here to waste people's time, including my own. I'm doing this to have a positive impact in the future. And, I, and you shared a little bit with me about your own personal perspective about where this is going and why you're so concerned about it if shit hits the fan. And do you want to share that with us, too? Yeah. You know, briefly, we're all concerned. We all look at the things. We see the FEMA plans. We can even just see these blooms. And we get nervous. We think, oh, you know, what if earthquake hits and the house gets destroyed, or what if I can't get to where I'm going? But that's not really the major thing you need to be concerned about. And if you follow Katrina, if you follow the earthquake, excuse me, the hurricane that hit New York recently, they're preparing people. Get food now. Get gas now. We won't be able to come and save you. Get prepared now. And more than half the people don't do anything, and then they're complaining for, at the government, why don't you give us food? Why don't you save us? Why don't you take care of us after the fact? And now let that be a prime example of if something bad does happen, what that is, what that will mean. And the thing is, it's not the earth you really need to be concerned about. It's what you're going to do if something hits the fan, you know what I mean? And we all have health insurance, life insurance, car insurance, home insurance, flood insurance. You know, how hard is it just to get a few months of food in your house, a few months of gas in your house? How are you going to heat your home in the winter if something goes down and transportation stops? And you really want to rely on others to get food if you can't get it? No. And the thing is, when people lose everything, they lose it. And you need to be concerned about other people and feeding your own family because that's really the major concern I have personally, just looking at the outlook of people and their nature. So, you know, I just strongly suggest just get whatever you can afford, just get some canned food, just something. Because if something goes down and you can't get food, you don't want to take care of your family and feed your family. You don't want to see violence anywhere. And if everybody does that, there will be no violence. So that's just a strong suggestion that I have. So when your children are starving, you'll do whatever it takes to feed them, including your neighbors. that might know you have food, too. <laughs> so it's just important to recognize that. So where can people find your stuff besides your YouTube channel, which is the United Knowledge, all one word, or you can search Booms, and his, his Boom video that I've posted a few times in chat today will be at the top of the list. You've put out some excellent threads on GLP. Yeah. My username on GLP is Bending Light. You can find me on Facebook, 
Just put in United Knowledge on Facebook. You should be able to find me. And one last thing. If any of you have questions, feel free to message me. And everything I said is documented. I give links and sources to everything. If you would like to see how there's a global play movement sequence ongoing, check out the video, and then go to the Bully website yourself, plug in the dates, see how the plate is adjusting, and see for yourself how there's bigger earthquakes on the other side of the globe in the same location over and over and over again. Check the articles. Read the quotes from the officials. You know, I, I always say, don't believe me. Don't just blindly accept what I say. Go out and read and see for yourself and let it settle in with you. I mean, no one's going to fully comprehend all of this right away, so I ask of people to actually do the research and see for yourself how this is really happening. And I would appreciate that, too. Yeah, that was a, another reason that I wanted to have you on, too. Um, and I want to encourage people to really watch some of his videos, especially the, the boom one that we've posted. It's well worth your time, especially if you're trying to make connections to questions that you have. How to go about doing your research and when you see his videos and how he's laid everything out like you could basically teach it to a five-year-old. Well, I basically, I mean, I just check magnetic field data out every day. I check earthquake information, buoy information. I've been, I still have a life, I still have responsibilities, so I haven't been zoomed in on the booms all the time, but I just do a search for the last 24 hours for booms on the search engine and see the new station articles that come up. But everything I do is just all public data, and I post the links to the public data, and you can see for yourself. Well, there's a little bit of time left. I'd just like to say one last thing. There's no reason to be nervous or fearful about anything, because we know what to look for. And all these booms, even though they're not being truthful about them, before any major events, there will be more booms and more shaking that are unexplained, but even more than we're seeing now. So this is important to recognize that. And one last thing, look at the indoor Australian plate over the next few months. And if you see a buoy showing a plate adjustment and a big earthquake there, and you see a major earthquake in the lower America within the next few days, they are as plate movement sequences for real. I mean, it's been six times in a row. So it's important that people pay attention to that as well. Jules was messaging me, you got to get him back on again. <laughs> you might, <laughs> might have really started something here. It's good that you're getting your information out in other ways, too, and kind of like cross, you know, getting some cross-pollination from people who are paying attention yeah. to the radiation thing. And we need more of that because there's so much that we can all contribute to everything. We had a guy on our show in the past a couple of times early to it, YouTube tries to follow all the methane events, and I know he would love to have a conversation with you sometime, so I'd like to talk to you off air a little bit about that and help me okay. facilitate that. So you're welcome to come back anytime. Thank you. Everyone, thanks for hanging out with us today. started doing stuff on and you can see they, they had dug a, a big square like this and you can see in the wall where all the midden stuff is and then right on top of that there's this sand layer in there. I mean just right on top of it. So these people were probably living there and this earthquake happened and they were just inundated. <laughs> so what, what would it have buried them or what? Apparently so, you know. The thing is that the whole that whole property is now in cultivation so we're going to wait and see if we can ever get them to they want to let it lie fallow one year, maybe let us do some, some wider excavations in there. That, I mean, that, that would be a dream, because you're really getting a snapshot then. I mean, you could even theoretically find bodies on the floors and that kind of stuff, you know, just like in Pompeii. Yeah, because see, that's crazy, because I read up on the history of the 1811 earthquake, or the series of them, and all I could find was the count of one man dying because a tree, a tree limb fell on him. Mm -hmm. But you're saying that, that was a pretty minor earthquake. That's the thing. A lot of these earlier ones were much stronger than that. Well, the minor one didn't it ring church bells up in Boston? Well, and crack windows in southern Michigan. Or whatever, supposedly. <laughs> but that's still. It's there were some that were a lot stronger than that. And there's a there's a woman named Tish Tuttle. What's her name? And she 
she's a, a seismologist, a person who, who studies these things, and she goes around and they go out onto various places where these sand blows and they'll dig a, a trench with a backhoe through it, and they can go down in there, and what they can do is they can find like some some organic material above the sand blow, just above it and just below it, and they can, you know, get dates on that and get a real good idea of when the thing occurred. You know, and then every now and then they're actually on archaeological sites. Wow. Um, so, uh, you know, the, and we have to be careful, though, because we don't really want to take a backhoe out on an archaeological site. Oh, unless, yeah. Unless we're real sure about something. Right. And the Indians, of course, just raise cane, you know, if we hit the oh, yeah. animals and stuff. But I think even that, at that site, if there were people that had been killed by the earthquake, they'd even allow that just because it would be real interesting.